Around the World in Eighty Days by Jules Verne, translated by George Makepeace Towell. Chapter 24, during which Mr. Fogg and party crossed the Pacific Ocean. What happened when the pilot boat came in sight of Shanghai will be easily guessed. The signals made by the tankadier had been seen by the captain of the Yokohama steamer, who, espying the flag at half-mast, had directed his course towards the little craft. Phileas Fogg, after paying the stipulated price of his passage to John Busby, and rewarding that worthy with the additional sum of five hundred and fifty pounds, ascended the steamer with Aouda and Fix, and they started at once for Nagasaki and Yokohama. They reached their destination on the morning of the 14th of November. Phileas Fogg lost no time in going on board the Carnatic, where he learned to Aouda's great delight, and perhaps to his own, though he betrayed no emotion, that Passepartout, a Frenchman, had really arrived on her the day before. The San Francisco steamer was announced to leave that very evening, and it became necessary to find Passepartout, if possible, without delay. Mr. Fogg applied in vain to the French and English consuls, and after wandering through the streets a long time, began to despair of finding his missing servant. Chance, or perhaps a kind of presentiment, at last led him into the Honorable Mr. Battlecar's theater. He certainly would not have recognized Passepartout in the eccentric Montbank's costume, but the latter, lying on his back, perceived his master in the gallery. He could not help starting, which so changed the position of his nose as to bring the pyramid pell-mell upon the stage. All this Passepartout learned from Aouda, who recounted to him what had taken place on the voyage from Hong Kong to Shanghai on the Tankadier, in company with one Mr. Fix. Passepartout did not change countenance on hearing this name. He thought that the time had not yet arrived to divulge to his master what had taken place between the detective and himself and in the account he gave of his absence he simply excused himself for having been overtaken by drunkenness in smoking opium at a tavern in hong kong mr fogg heard this narrative coldly without a word and then furnished his man with funds necessary to obtain clothing more in harmony with his position Within an hour the Frenchman had cut off his nose and parted with his wings, and retained nothing about him which recalled the sectary of the god Tingal. The steamer, which was about to depart from Yokohama to San Francisco, belonged to the Pacific Mail Steamship Company, and was named the General Grant. She was a large paddle-wheel steamer of 2,500 tons, well-equipped and very fast. The massive walking beam rose and fell above the deck. At one end a piston rod worked up and down, and at the other was a connecting rod, which in changing the rectilinear motion to a circular one was directly connected with the shaft of the paddles. The general grant was rigged with three masts, giving a large capacity for sails, and thus materially aiding the steam power. By making twelve miles an hour she would cross the ocean in twenty-one days. Phileas Fogg was therefore justified in hoping that he would reach San Francisco by the 2nd of December, New York by the 11th, and London on the 20th, thus gaining several hours on the fatal date of the 21st of December. There was a full complement of passengers on board, among them English, many Americans, a large number of coolies on their way to California, and several East Indian officers who were spending their vacation in making the tour of the world. Nothing of moment happened on the voyage. The steamer, sustained on its large paddles, rolled but little, and the Pacific almost justified its name. Mr. Fogg was as calm and taciturn as ever. His young companion felt herself more and more attached to him by other ties than gratitude. His silent but generous nature impressed her more than she thought, and it was almost unconsciously that she yielded to emotions which did not seem to have the least effect upon her protector. Aouda took the keenest interest in his plans, and became impatient at any incident which seemed likely to retard his journey. She often chatted with Passepartout, who did not fail to perceive the state of the lady's heart, 
and being the most faithful of domestics, he never exhausted his eulogies of Phileas Fogg's honesty, generosity, and devotion. He took pains to calm Aouda's doubts of a successful termination of the journey, telling her that the most difficult part of it had passed, that now they were beyond the fantastic countries of Japan and China, and were fairly on their way to civilized places again. A railway train from San Francisco to New York and a transatlantic steamer from New York to Liverpool would doubtless bring them to the end of this impossible journey round the world within the period agreed upon. On the ninth day after leaving Yokohama, Phileas Fogg had traversed exactly one-half of the terrestrial globe. The General Grant passed on the 23rd of November, the 180th meridian, and was at the very antipodes of London. Mr. Fogg had, it is true, exhausted fifty-two of the eighty days in which he was to complete the tour, and there were only twenty-eight left. But though he was only halfway by the difference of meridians, he had really gone over two-thirds of the whole journey, for he had been obliged to make long circuits from London to Aden, from Aden to Bombay, from Calcutta to Singapore, and from Singapore to Yokohama. Could he have followed without deviation the fiftieth parallel, which is that of London, the whole distance would have only been about twelve thousand miles, whereas he would be forced by the irregular methods of locomotion to traverse twenty-six thousand, of which he had, on the twenty-third of November, accomplished seventeen thousand five hundred. And now the course was a straight one, and Fix was no longer there to put obstacles in their way. It happened also on the 23rd of November that Passepartout made a joyful discovery. It will be remembered that the obstinate fellow had insisted on keeping his famous family watch at London time, and on regarding that of the countries he had passed through as quite false and unreliable. Now on this day, though, he had not changed the hands. He found that his watch exactly agreed with the ship's chronometers. His triumph was hilarious. He would have liked to know what Fix would say if he were aboard. "'The rogue told me a lot of stories,' repeated Passepartout, "'about the meridians, the sun, and the moon. Moon, indeed. Moonshine, more likely. If one listened to that sort of people, a pretty sort of time one would keep. I was sure that the sun would some day regulate itself by my watch.' Passepartout was ignorant that if the face of his watch had been divided into twenty-four hours, like the Italian clocks, he would have had no reason for exultation, for the hands of his watch would then, instead of as now indicating nine o'clock in the morning, indicate nine o'clock in the evening, that is, the twenty-first hour after midnight, precisely the difference between London time and that of the one hundred and eightieth meridian. But if Fix had been able to explain this purely physical effect, Passepartout would not have admitted, even if he had comprehended it. Moreover, if the detective had been on board at that moment, Passepartout would have joined issue with him on a quite different subject, and in an entirely different manner. Where was Fix at that moment? He was actually on board the General Grant. On reaching Yokohama, the detective, leaving Mr. Fogg, whom he expected to meet again during the day, had repaired at once to the English consulate, where he at last found the warrant of arrest. It had followed him from Bombay, and had come by the Carnatic, on which steamer he himself was supposed to be. Fix's disappointment may be imagined when he reflected that the warrant was now useless. Mr. Fogg had left English ground, and it was now necessary to procure his extradition. Well, thought Fix, after a moment of anger, my warrant is not good here, but it will be in England. The rogue evidently intends to return to his own country, thinking he has thrown the police off his track. Good, I will follow him across the Atlantic. As for the money, heaven grant there may be some left. But the fellow has already spent in travelling, rewards, trials, bail, elephants, and all sorts of charges, more than five thousand pounds. Yet, after all, the bank is rich. His course decided on, he went on board the General Grant, and was there when Mr. Fogg and Aouda arrived. To his utter amazement he recognized Passepartout, despite his theatrical disguise. He quickly concealed himself in his cabin to avoid an awkward explanation, 
and hoped, thanks to the number of passengers, to remain unperceived by Mr. Fogg's servant. On that very day, however, he met Passepartout face to face on the forward deck. The latter, without a word, made a rush for him, grasped him by the throat, and much to the amusement of a group of Americans, who immediately began to bet on him, administered to the detective a perfect volley of blows, which proved the great superiority of French over English pugilistic skill. When Passepartout had finished, he found himself relieved and comforted. Fix got up in a somewhat rumpled condition, and looking at his adversary, coldly said, "'Have you done?' "'For this time, yes.' "'Then let me have a word with you. But I—' "'In your master's interests.' Passepartout seemed to be vanquished by Fix's coolness, for he quietly followed him, and they sat down aside from the rest of the passengers. "'You have given me a thrashing,' said Fix. "'Good. I expected it. Now listen to me. Up to this time I have been Mr. Fogg's adversary. I am now in his game.' "'Aha!' cried Passepartout. "'You are convinced he is an honest man?' "'No,' replied Fix coldly. I think him a rascal. Shh! Don't budge, and let me speak. As long as Mr. Fogg was on English ground, it was for my interest to detain him there until my warrant of arrest arrived. I did everything I could to keep him back. I sent the Bombay priests after him. I got you intoxicated at Hong Kong. I separated you from him, and I made him miss the Yokohama steamer. Passepartout listened with closed fists. Now— resumed Fix. Mr. Fogg seems to be going back to England. Well, I will follow him there, but hereafter I will do as much to keep obstacles out of his way as I have done up to this time to put them in his path. I've changed my game, you see, and simply because it was for my interest to change it. Your interest is the same as mine, for it is only in England that you will ascertain whether you are in the service of a criminal or an honest man." Passepartout listened very attentively to Fix, and was convinced that he spoke with entire good faith. "'Are we friends?' asked the detective. "'Friends? No,' replied Passepartout. "'But allies, perhaps. At the least sign of treason, however, I'll twist your neck for you.' "'Agreed,' said the detective quietly. Eleven days later, on the 3rd of December, the General Grant entered the bay of the Golden Gate and reached San Francisco. Mr. Fogg had neither gained nor lost a single day. End of Chapter 24 Chapter 25 In Which a Slight Glimpse is Had of San Francisco It was seven in the morning when Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Passepartout set foot upon the American continent if this name can be given to the floating quay upon which they disembarked. These quays, rising and falling with the tide, thus facilitate the loading and unloading of vessels. Alongside them were clippers of all sizes, steamers of all nationalities, and the steamboats with several decks rising one above the other, which ply on the Sacramento and its tributaries. There were also heaped up the products of a commerce which extends to Mexico, Chile, Peru, Brazil, Europe, Asia, and all the Pacific Islands. Passepartout, in his joy on reaching at last the American continent, thought he would manifest it by executing a perilous vault in fine style. But tumbling upon some worm-eaten planks, he fell through them. Put out of countenance by the manner in which he thus set foot upon the new world, he uttered a loud cry which so frightened the innumerable cormorants and pelicans that are always perched upon these movable quays that they flew noisily away. Mr. Fogg, on reaching shore, proceeded to find out at what hour the first train left for New York, and learned that this was at six o'clock p.m. He had, therefore, an entire day to spend in the Californian capital. Taking a carriage at a charge of three dollars, he and Aouda entered it while Passepartout mounted the box beside the driver, and they set up for the International Hotel. From his exalted position Passepartout observed with much curiosity the wide streets, the low, evenly ranged houses, the Anglo-Saxon Gothic churches, the great docks, the palatial wooden and brick wire houses, 
the numerous conveyances omnibuses horse cars and upon the sidewalks not only americans and europeans but chinese and indians passepartout was surprised at all he saw san francisco was no longer the legendary city of eighteen forty nine a city of banditti assassins and incendiaries who had flocked hither in crowds in pursuit of plunder a paradise of outlaws where they gambled with gold dust a revolver in one hand and a bowie knife in the other it was now a great commercial emporium the lofty tower of its city hall overlooked the whole panorama of the streets and avenues which cut each other at right angles and in the midst of which appeared pleasant verdant squares while beyond appeared the chinese quarter seemingly imported from the celestial empire in a toy box sombreros and red shirts and plumed indians were rarely to be seen but there were silk hats and black coats everywhere worn by a multitude of nervously active gentlemanly-looking men some of the streets especially montgomery street which is to san francisco what regent street is to london the boulevard des italiens to paris and broadway to new york were lined with splendid and spacious stores which exposed in their windows the products of the entire world when passepartout reached the international hotel it did not seem to him as if he had left england at all the ground floor of the hotel was occupied by a large bar a sort of restaurant freely open to all passers-by who might partake of dried beef oyster soup biscuits and cheese without taking out their purses payment was made only for the ale porter or sherry which was drunk this seemed very american to passepartout the hotel refreshment rooms were comfortable and mr fogg and aouda installing themselves at a table were abundantly served on diminutive plates by negroes of darkest hue after breakfast mr fogg accompanied by aouda started for the english consulate to have his passport visaed as he was going out he met passepartout who asked him if it would not be well before taking the train to purchase some dozens of enfield rifles and colt's revolvers he had been listening to stories of attacks upon the trains by the sioux and pawnees mr fogg thought it a useless precaution but told him to do as he thought best and went on to the consulate he had not proceeded two hundred steps however when by the greatest chance in the world he met fix the detective seemed wholly taken by surprise what had mr fogg and himself crossed the pacific together and not met on the steamer at least fix felt honored to behold once more the gentleman to whom he owed so much and as his business recalled him to europe he should be delighted to continue the journey in such pleasant company mr fogg replied that the honor would be his and the detective who was determined not to lose sight of him begged permission to accompany them in their walk about san francisco a request which mr fogg readily granted they soon found themselves in montgomery street where a great crowd was collected the sidewalks street horse-car rails the shop doors the windows of the houses and even the roofs were full of people men were going about carrying large posters and flags and streamers were floating in the wind while loud cries were heard on every hand hurrah for Cammerfield! hurrah for mendeboy it was a political meeting at least so fix conjectured who said to mr fogg perhaps we had better not mingle with the crowd there may be danger in it yes returned mr fogg and blows even if they are political are still blows fix smiled at this remark and in order to be able to see without being jostled about the party took a position on the top of a flight of steps situated at the upper end of montgomery street opposite them on the other side of the street between a coal wharf and a petroleum warehouse a large platform had been erected in the open air towards which the current of the crowd seemed to be directed for what purpose was this meeting what was the occasion of this excited assemblage phileas fogg could not imagine was it to nominate some high official a governor or member of congress it was not improbable so agitated was the multitude before them just at this moment there was an unusual stir in the human mass all the hands were raised in the air 
Some, tightly closed, seemed to disappear suddenly in the midst of the cries, an energetic way, no doubt, of casting a vote. The crowd swayed back, the banners and flags wavered, disappeared an instant, and then reappeared in tatters. The undulations of the human surge reached the steps, while all the heads floundered on the surface like a sea agitated by a squall. Many of the black hats disappeared, and the greater part of the crowd seemed to have diminished in height. "'It is evidently a meeting,' said Fix, "'and its object must be an exciting one. I should not wonder if it were about the Alabama, despite the fact that the question is settled.' "'Perhaps,' replied Mr. Fogg simply. "'At least there are two champions in presence of each other, "'the Honorable Mr. Cammerfield and the Honorable Mr. Mandeboy. "'Ayuda, leaning upon Mr. Fogg's arm, "'observed the tumultuous scene with surprise, "'while Fix asked the man near him what the cause of it all was. "'Before the man could reply, a fresh agitation arose. "'Hurrahs and excited shouts were heard. The staffs of the banners began to be used as offensive weapons, and fists flew about in every direction. Thumps were exchanged from the tops of the carriages and omnibuses, which had been blocked up in the crowd. Boots and shoes went whirling through the air, and Mr. Fogg thought he even heard the crack of revolvers mingling in the din, the rout approaching the stairway and flowed over the lower step. One of the parties had evidently been repulsed, but the mere lookers-on could not tell whether Mandeboy or Camerfield had gained the upper hand. "'It would be prudent for us to retire,' said Fix, who was anxious that Mr. Fogg should not receive any injury, at least until they got back to London. "'If there is any question about England in all this, and we were recognized, I fear it would go hard with us.' "'An English subject,' began Mr. Fogg, he did not finish his sentence, for a terrific hubbub now arose on the terrace behind the flight of steps where they stood, and there were frantic shouts of, Hurrah for Mandeboy! Hip, hip, hurrah! It was a band of voters coming to the rescue of their allies and taking the Camerfield forces in flank. Mr. Fogg, Aouda, and Fix found themselves between two fires. It was too late to escape. The torrent of men armed with loaded canes and sticks was irresistible. Phileas Fogg and Fix were roughly hustled in their attempts to protect their fair companion. The former, as cool as ever, tried to defend himself with the weapons which nature has placed at the end of every Englishman's arm, but in vain. A big brawny fellow with a red beard, flushed face, and broad shoulders, who seemed to be the chief of the band, raised his clenched fist to strike Fogg whom he would have given a crushing blow had not Fix rushed in and received it in his stead. An enormous bruise immediately made its appearance under the detective silk hat, which was completely smashed in. "'Yankee!' exclaimed Mr. Fogg, darting a contemptuous look at the ruffian. "'Englishman!' returned the other. "'We will meet again. When you please. What is your name?' "'Phileas Fogg. And yours?' "'Colonel Stamp Proctor?' The human tide now swept by after overturning Fix, who speedily got upon his feet again, though with tattered clothes. Happily he was not seriously hurt. His traveling overcoat was divided into two unequal parts, and his trousers resembled those of certain Indians, which fit less compactly than they are easy to put on. Aouda had escaped unharmed, and Fix alone bore marks of the fray in his black and blue bruise. "'Thanks,' said Mr. Fogg to the detective as soon as they were out of the crowd. "'No thanks are necessary,' replied Fix. "'But let us go. Where? To a tailor's.' Such a visit was indeed opportune. The clothing of both Mr. Fogg and Fix was in rags, as if they had themselves been actively engaged in the contest between Camerfield and Mandeboy. An hour after they were once more suitably attired, and with Aouda returned to the International Hotel. Passepartout was waiting for his master, armed with half a dozen six-barreled revolvers. When he perceived Fix he knit his brows, but Aouda, having in a few words told him of their adventure, his countenance resumed its placid expression. Fix evidently was no longer an enemy, but an ally. He was faithfully keeping his word. 
Dinner over, the coach which was to convey the passengers and their luggage to the station drew up to the door. As he was getting in, Mr. Fogg said to Fix, "'You have not seen this Colonel Proctor again?' "'No.' "'I will come back to America to find him,' said Phileas Fogg calmly. "'It would not be right for an Englishman to permit himself to be treated in that way without retaliating.' The detective smiled, but did not reply. It was clear that Mr. Fogg was one of those Englishmen who, while they do not tolerate dueling at home, fight abroad when their honor is attacked. At a quarter before six the travellers reached the station and found the train ready to depart. As he was about to enter it, Mr. Fogg called a porter and said to him, "'My friend, was there not some trouble to-day in San Francisco?' "'It was a political meeting, sir,' replied the porter. "'But I thought there was a great deal of disturbance in the streets.' "'It was only a meeting assembled for an election.' "'The election of a general-in-chief, no doubt.' asked Mr. Fogg. No, sir, of a justice of the peace. Phileas Fogg got into the train, which started off at full speed. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 In which Phileas Fogg and party travel by the Pacific Railroad. From ocean to ocean, so say the Americans, and these four words compose the general designation of the great trunk line which crosses the entire width of the United States. The Pacific Railroad is, however, really divided into two distinct lines, the Central Pacific, between San Francisco and Ogden, and the Union Pacific, between Ogden and Omaha. Five main lines connect Omaha with New York. New York and San Francisco are thus united by an uninterrupted metal ribbon, which measures no less than 3,786 miles. Between Omaha and the Pacific the railway crosses a territory which is still infested by Indians and wild beasts, and a large tract which the Mormons, after they were driven from Illinois in 1845, began to colonize. The journey from New York to San Francisco consumed, formerly, under the most favorable conditions, at least six months. It is now accomplished in seven days. It was in 1862 that, in spite of the southern members of Congress who wished a more southerly route, it was decided to lay the road between the 41st and 42nd parallels. President Lincoln himself fixed the end of the line at Omaha, in Nebraska. The work was at once commenced, and pursued with true American energy. Nor did the rapidity with which it went on injuriously affect its good execution. The road grew on the prairies a mile and a half a day. A locomotive running on the rails laid down the evening before brought the rails to be laid on the morrow, and advanced upon them as fast as they were put in position. The Pacific Railroad is joined by several branches in Iowa, Kansas, Colorado, and Oregon. On leaving Omaha, it passes along the left bank of the Platte River as far as the junction of its northern branch, follows its southern branch, crosses the Laramie Territory and the Wasatch Mountains, turns the Great Salt Lake and reaches Salt Lake City, the Mormon capital, plunges into the Tooele Valley across the American desert, cedar and humboldt mountains the sierra nevada and descends via sacramento to the pacific its grade even on the rocky mountains never exceeding one hundred and twelve feet to the mile such was the road to be traversed in seven days which would enable phileas fogg at least so he hoped to take the atlantic steamer at new york on the eleventh for liverpool the car which he occupied was a sort of long omnibus on eight wheels and with no compartments in the interior. It was supplied with two rows of seats perpendicular to the direction of the train on either side of an aisle which conducted to the front and rear platforms. These platforms were found throughout the train, and the passengers were able to pass from one end of the train to the other. It was supplied with saloon cars, balcony cars, restaurants and smoking cars. Theater cars alone were wanting, and they will have these some day. Book and news dealers, sellers of edibles, drinkables, and cigars, who seemed to have plenty of customers, were continually circulating in the aisles. 
The train left Oakland Station at six o'clock. It was already night, cold and cheerless, the heavens being overcast with clouds which seemed to threaten snow. The train did not proceed rapidly. Counting the stoppages, it did not run more than twenty miles an hour, which was a sufficient speed, however, to enable it to reach Omaha within its designated time. There was but little conversation in the car, and soon many of the passengers were overcome with sleep. Passepartout found himself beside the detective, but he did not talk to him. After recent events their relations with each other had grown somewhat cold. There could no longer be mutual sympathy or intimacy between them. Fix's manner had not changed, but Passepartout was very reserved and ready to strangle his former friend on the slightest provocation. Snow began to fall an hour after they started, a fine snow, however, which happily could not obstruct the train. Nothing could be seen from the windows but a vast white sheet against which the smoke of the locomotive had a grayish aspect. At eight o'clock a steward entered the car and announced that the time for going to bed had arrived, and in a few minutes the car was transformed into a dormitory. The backs of the seats were thrown back, bedsteads carefully packed were rolled out by an ingenious system, berths were suddenly improvised, and each traveller had soon, at his disposition, a comfortable bed, protected from curious eyes by thick curtains. The sheets were clean and the pillows soft. It only remained to go to bed and sleep, which everybody did, while the train sped on across the state of California. The country between San Francisco and Sacramento is not very hilly. The Central Pacific, taking Sacramento for its starting point, extends eastward to meet the road from Omaha. The line from San Francisco to Sacramento runs in a northeasterly direction along the American River, which empties into San Pablo Bay. The one hundred and twenty miles between these cities were accomplished in six hours, and towards midnight, while fast asleep, the travelers passed through Sacramento, so that they saw nothing of that important place, the seat of the state government with its fine quays, its broad streets, its noble hotels, squares, and churches. The train on leaving Sacramento, passing the junction Rockland, Auburn, and Colfax, entered the range of the Sierra Nevada. Cisco was reached at seven in the morning, and an hour later the dormitory was transformed into an ordinary car, and the travelers could observe the picturesque beauties of the mountain region through which they were steaming. The railway track wound in and out among the passes, now approaching the mountain sides, now suspended over precipices, avoiding abrupt angles by bold curves, plunging into narrow defiles which seemed to have no outlet the locomotive its great funnel emitting a weird light with its sharp bell and its cowcatcher extended like a spur mingled its shrieks and bellowings with the noise of torrents and cascades and twined its smoke among the branches of the gigantic pines there were few or no bridges or tunnels on the route the railway turned around the sides of the mountains and did not attempt to violate nature by taking the shortest cut from one point to another the train entered the state of Nevada through the Carson Valley about nine o'clock, going always northeasterly, and at midday reached Reno, where there was a delay of twenty minutes for breakfast. From this point the road running along Humboldt River passed northward for several miles by its banks, then it turned eastward and kept by the river until it reached the Humboldt Range, nearly at the extreme eastern limit of Nevada. Having breakfasted, Mr. Fogg and his companions resumed their places in the car and observed the varied landscape which unfolded itself as they passed along the vast prairies, the mountains lining the horizon and the creeks with their frothy, foaming streams. Sometimes a great herd of buffaloes, massing together in the distance, seemed like a movable dam. These innumerable multitudes of ruminating beasts often form an insurmountable obstacle to the passage of the trains. Thousands of them have been seen passing over the track for hours together in compact ranks. The locomotive is then forced to stop and wait till the road is once more clear. This happened, indeed, to the train in which Mr. Fogg was traveling. 
About twelve o'clock a troop of ten or twelve thousand head of buffalo encumbered the track. The locomotive, slackening its speed, tried to clear the way with its cow-catcher, but the mass of animals was too great. The buffaloes marched along with a tranquil gait, uttering now and then deafening bellowings. There was no use of interrupting them, for, having taken a particular direction, nothing can moderate and change their course. It is a torrent of living flesh which no dam could contain. The travelers gazed on this curious spectacle from the platforms, but Phileas Fogg, who had the most reason of all to be in a hurry, remained in his seat and waited philosophically until it should please the buffaloes to get out of the way. Passepartout was furious at the delay they occasioned, and longed to discharge his arsenal of revolvers upon them. "'What a country!' cried he. "'Mere cattle stop the trains and go by in a procession, just as if they were not impeding travel. Parbleu! I should like to know if Mr. Fogg foresaw this mishap in his program. And here's an engineer who doesn't dare to run the locomotive into this herd of beasts.' The engineer did not try to overcome the obstacle and he was wise. He would have crushed the first buffaloes, no doubt, with the cow-catcher, but the locomotive, however powerful, would soon have been checked. The train would inevitably have been thrown off the track, and would then have been helpless. The best course was to wait patiently and regain the lost time by greater speed when the obstacle was removed. The procession of buffaloes lasted three full hours, and it was night before the track was clear. The last ranks of the herd were now passing over the rails, while the first had already disappeared below the southern horizon. It was eight o'clock when the train passed through the defiles of the Humboldt Range, and half-past nine when it penetrated Utah, the region of the Great Salt Lake, the singular colony of the Mormons. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 in which Passepartout undergoes, at a speed of twenty miles an hour, a course of Mormon history. During the night of the 5th of December, the train ran southeasterly for about fifty miles, then rose an equal distance in a northeasterly direction towards the Great Salt Lake. Passepartout, about nine o'clock, went out upon the platform to take the air. The weather was cold, the heavens gray, but it was not snowing. The sun's disk, enlarged by the mist, seemed an enormous ring of gold, and Passepartout was amusing himself by calculating its value in pounds sterling, when he was diverted from this interesting study by a strange-looking personage who made his appearance on the platform. This personage, who had taken the train at Elko, was tall and dark, with black moustache, black stockings, a black silk hat, a black waistcoat, black trousers a white cravat, and dog-skin gloves. He might have been taken for a clergyman. He went from one end of the train to the other, and affixed to the door of each car a notice written in manuscript. Passepartout approached and read one of these notices, which stated that Elder William Hitch, Mormon missionary, taking advantage of his presence on train number 48, would deliver a lecture on Mormonism in car number 117, from eleven to twelve o'clock, and that he invited all who were desirous of being instructed concerning the mysteries of the religion of the Latter-day Saints to attend. "'I'll go,' said Passepartout to himself. He knew nothing of Mormonism except the custom of polygamy, which is its foundation. The news quickly spread through the train, which contained about one hundred passengers, thirty of whom, at most, attracted by the notice, ensconced themselves in car number 117. Passepartout took one of the front seats. Neither Mr. Fogg nor Fix cared to attend. At the appointed hour Elder William Hitch rose, and in an irritated voice, as if he had already been contradicted, said, "'I'll tell you that Joe Smith is a martyr, that his brother Hiram is a martyr, and that the persecutions of the United States government against the prophets will also make a martyr of Brigham Young. Who dares to say the contrary?' No one ventured to gainsay the missionary, whose excited tone contrasted curiously with his naturally calm visage. No doubt his anger arose from the hardships to which the Mormons were actually subjected. The government had just succeeded with some difficulty in reducing these independent fanatics to its rule. It had made itself master of Utah, 
and subjected that territory to the laws of the Union, after imprisoning Brigham Young on a charge of rebellion and polygamy. The disciples of the prophet had since redoubled their efforts, and resisted by words at least the authority of Congress. Elder Hitch, as is seen, was trying to make proselytes on the very railway trains. Then, emphasizing his words with his loud voice and frequent gestures, he related the history of the Mormons from biblical times, how that in Israel a Mormon prophet of the tribe of Joseph published the annals of the new religion and bequeathed them to his son Mormon, how many centuries later a translation of this precious book, which was written in Egyptian, was made by Joseph Smith, Jr., a Vermont farmer, who revealed himself as a mystical prophet in 1825, and how, in short, the celestial messenger appeared to him in an illuminated forest and gave him the annals of the Lord. Several of the audience, not being much interested in the missionary's narrative, here left the car. But Elder Hitch, continuing his lecture, related how Smith, Jr., with his father, two brothers, and a few disciples, founded the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which adopted, not only in America, but in England, Norway, and Sweden, and Germany, counts many artisans as well as men engaged in the liberal professions among its members, how a colony was established in Ohio, a temple erected there at a cost of two hundred thousand dollars, and a town built at Kirtland, how Smith became an enterprising banker, and received from a simple mummy showman a papyrus scroll written by Abraham, and several famous Egyptians. The elder's story became somewhat wearisome, and his audience grew gradually less, until it was reduced to twenty passengers, but this did not disconcert the enthusiast, who proceeded with the story of Joseph Smith's bankruptcy in 1837, and how his ruined creditors gave him a coat of tar and feathers. His reappearance some years afterwards, more honorable and honored than ever, at Independence, Missouri, the chief of a flourishing colony of three thousand disciples, and his pursuit thence by outraged Gentiles and retirement into the far west. Ten hearers only were now left, among them honest Passepartout, who was listening with all his ears. Thus he learned that after long persecutions Smith reappeared in Illinois, and in 1839 founded a community at Nauvoo, on the Mississippi, numbering twenty-five thousand souls, of which he became mayor, chief justice, and general-in-chief, that he announced himself in 1843 as a candidate for the presidency of the United States, and that finally being drawn into the ambuscade at Carthage, he was thrown into prison and assassinated by a band of men disguised in masks. Passepartout was now the only person left in the car, and the elder, looking him full in the face, reminded him that two years after the assassination of Joseph Smith, the inspired prophet Brigham Young, his successor, left Nauvoo for the banks of the Great Salt Lake, where, in the midst of that fertile region, directly on the route of the emigrants who crossed Utah on their way to California, the new colony, thanks to the polygamy practiced by the Mormons, had flourished beyond expectations. And this, added Elder William Hitch, this is why the jealousy of Congress has been aroused against us. Why have the soldiers of the Union invaded the soil of Utah? Why has Brigham Young, our chief, been imprisoned in contempt of all justice? Shall we yield to force? Never! Driven from Vermont, driven from Illinois, driven from Ohio, driven from Missouri, driven from Utah, we shall yet find some independent territory on which to plant our tents. And you, my brother, continued the elder, fixing his angry eyes upon his single auditor, will you not plant yours there, too, under the shadow of our flag? No, replied Passepartout courageously, in his turn retiring from the car and leaving the elder to preach to vacancy. During the lecture the train had been making good progress, and towards half-past twelve it reached the northwest border of the Great Salt Lake. Thence the passengers could observe the vast extent of this interior sea, which is also called the Dead Sea, and into which flows an American Jordan. It is a picturesque expanse, framed in lofty crags in large strata, encrusted with white salt, a superb sheet of water which was formerly of larger extent than now, its shores having encroached with the lapse of time, and thus at once reduced its breadth and increased its depth. The Salt Lake, seventy miles long and thirty-five wide, 
is situated three miles eight hundred feet above the sea, quite different from Lake Asphaltite, whose depression is twelve hundred feet below the sea, it contains considerable salt, and one quarter of the weight of its water is solid matter, its specific weight being one thousand one hundred seventy, and after being distilled one thousand. Fishes are, of course, unable to live in it, and those which descend through the Jordan, the Weber, and other streams soon perish. The country around the lake was well cultivated, for the Mormons are mostly farmers, while ranches and pens for domesticated animals, fields of wheat, corn, and other cereals, luxuriant prairies, hedges of wild rose, clumps of acacias, and milkwort, would have been seen six months later. Now the ground was covered with a thin powdering of snow. The train reached Ogden at two o'clock, where it rested for six hours. Mr. Fogg and his party had time to pay a visit to Salt Lake City, connected with Ogden by a branch road, and they spent two hours in this strikingly American town, built on the pattern of other cities of the Union, like a checkerboard, with the somber sadness of right angles, as Victor Hugo expresses it, the founder of the city of the saints could not escape from the taste for symmetry which distinguishes the anglo-saxons in this strange country where the people are certainly not up to the level of their institutions everything is done squarely cities houses and follies the travellers then were promenading at three o'clock about the streets of the town built between the banks of the jordan and the spurs of the wasatch range they saw few or no churches but the prophet's mansion, the courthouse, and the arsenal, blue brick houses with verandas and porches, surrounded by gardens bordered with acacias, palms, and locusts. A clay and pebble wall built in 1853 surrounded the town, and in the principal street were the market and several hotels adorned with pavilions. The place did not seem thickly populated. The streets were almost deserted except in the vicinity of the temple, which they only reached after having traversed several quarters surrounded by palisades. There were many women, which was easily accounted for by the peculiar institution of the Mormons, but it must not be supposed that all the Mormons are polygamous. They are free to marry or not as they please, but it is worth noting that it is mainly the female citizens of Utah who are anxious to marry, as, according to the Mormon religion, maiden ladies are not admitted to the possession of its highest joys these poor creatures seem to be neither well off nor happy some the more well-to-do no doubt wore short open black silk dresses under a hood or modest shawl others were habited in indian fashion passepartout could not behold without a certain fright these women charged in groups with conferring happiness on a single mormon his common sense pitied above all the husband it seemed to him a terrible thing to have to guide so many wives at once across the vicissitudes of life, and to conduct them, as it were, in a body to the Mormon paradise, with the prospect of seeing them in the company of the glorious Smith, who doubtless was the chief ornament of that delightful place to all eternity. He felt decidedly repelled from such a vocation, and he imagined, perhaps he was mistaken, that the fair ones of Salt Lake City cast rather alarming glances on his person. Happily, his stay there was but brief. At four, the party found themselves again at the station, took their places in the train, and the whistle sounded for starting. Just at the moment, however, that the locomotive wheels began to move, cries of stop, stop, were heard. Trains, like time and tide, stopped for no one. The gentleman who uttered the cries was evidently a belated Mormon. He was breathless with running. Happily for him, the station had neither gates nor barriers. He rushed along the track, jumped on the rear platform of the train, and fell exhausted into one of the seats. Passepartout, who had been anxiously watching this amateur gymnast, approached him with lively interest, and learned that he had taken flight after an unpleasant domestic scene. When the Mormon had recovered his breath, Passepartout ventured to ask him politely how many wives he had for from the manner in which he had decamped it might be thought that he had twenty at least. One, sir, replied the Mormon, raising his arms heavenward, one, and that was enough. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 
in which Passepartout does not succeed in making anybody listen to reason. The train, on leaving Great Salt Lake at Ogden, passed northward for an hour as far as Weber River, having completed nearly nine hundred miles from San Francisco. From this point it took an easterly direction towards the jagged Wasatch Mountains. It was in the section included between this range and the Rocky Mountains that the American engineers found the most formidable difficulties in laying the road, and that the government granted a subsidy of forty-eight thousand dollars per mile, instead of sixteen thousand, allowed for the work done on the plains. But the engineers, instead of violating nature, avoided its difficulties by winding around instead of penetrating the rocks. One tunnel only, fourteen thousand feet in length, was pierced in order to arrive at the Great Basin. The track up to this time had reached its highest elevation at the Great Salt Lake. From this point it described a long curve descending towards Bitter Creek Valley, to rise again to the dividing ridge of the waters between the Atlantic and the Pacific. There were many creeks in this mountainous region, and it was necessary to cross Muddy Creek, Green Creek, and others upon culverts. Passepartout grew more and more impatient as they went on, while Fix longed to get out of this difficult region, and was more anxious than Phileas Fogg himself to be beyond the dangers of delays and accidents, and set foot on English soil. At ten o'clock at night the train stopped at Fort Bridger Station, and twenty minutes later entered Wyoming Territory, following the valley of Bitter Creek throughout. The next day, 7 December, they stopped for a quarter of an hour at Green River Station. Snow had fallen abundantly during the night, but being mixed with rain it had half melted, and did not interrupt their progress. The bad weather, however, annoyed Passepartout, for the accumulation of snow by blocking the wheels of the cars would certainly have been fatal to Mr. Fogg's tour. "'What an idea!' he said to himself. Why did my master make this journey in winter? Couldn't he have waited for the good season to increase his chances? While the worthy Frenchman was absorbed in the state of the sky and the depression of the temperature, Aouda was experiencing fears from a totally different cause. Several passengers had got off at Green River, and were walking up and down the platforms, and among these Aouda recognized Colonel Stamp Proctor, the same who had so grossly insulted Phileas Fogg at the San Francisco meeting. Not wishing to be recognized, the young woman drew back from the window, feeling much alarm at her discovery. She was attached to the man who, however coldly, gave her daily evidences of the most absolute devotion. She did not comprehend, perhaps, the depth of the sentiment with which her protector inspired her, which she called gratitude, but which, though she was unconscious of it, was really more than that. Her heart sank within her when she recognized the man whom Mr. Fogg desired, sooner or later, to call to account for his conduct. Chance alone, it was clear, had brought Colonel Proctor on this train, but there he was, and it was necessary at all hazards that Phileas Fogg should not perceive his adversary. Aouda seized a moment when Mr. Fogg was asleep to tell Fix and Passepartout whom she had seen. "'That Proctor on this train?' cried Fix. "'Well, reassure yourself, madam. Before he settles with Mr. Fogg, he has got to deal with me. It seems to me that I was the more insulted of the two. "'And besides,' added Passepartout, "'I'll take charge of him, colonel as he is.' "'Mr. Fix,' resumed Aouda, "'Mr. Fogg will allow no one to avenge him. He said that he would come back to America to find this man. Should he perceive Colonel Proctor, we could not prevent a collision which might have terrible results. He must not see him.' "'You are right, madam,' replied Fix. "'A meeting between them might ruin all. Whether he were victorious or beaten, Mr. Fogg would be delayed, and—and, and, added Passepartout, that would play the game of the gentlemen of the Reform Club. In four days we shall be in New York. Well, if my master does not leave this car during those four days, we may hope that chance will not bring him face to face with this confounded American. We must, if possible, prevent his stirring out of it. The conversation dropped. Mr. Fogg had just woke up and was looking out of the window. 
Soon after, Passepartout, without being heard by his master or Aouda, whispered to the detective, "'Would you really fight for him?' "'I would do anything,' replied Fix, in a tone which betrayed determined will, "'to get him back living to Europe.' Passepartout felt something like a shudder shoot through his frame, but his confidence in his master remained unbroken. Was there any means of detaining Mr. Fogg in the car to avoid a meeting between him and the colonel? It ought not to be a difficult task, since that gentleman was naturally sedentary and little curious. The detective at least seemed to have found a way, for after a few moments he said to Mr. Fogg, "'These are long and slow hours, sir, that we are passing on the railway. Yes, replied Mr. Fogg, but they pass. You were in the habit of playing whist, resumed Fix, on the steamers. Yes, but it would be difficult to do so here. I have neither cards nor partners. Oh, but we can easily buy some cards, for they are sold on all the American trains. And as for partners, if Madame plays— Certainly, sir, Ayuda quickly replied. I understand whist. It is part of an English education. I myself have some pretensions to playing a good game. Well, here are three of us, and a dummy. As you please, sir, replied Phileas Fogg, heartily glad to resume his favorite pastime even on the railway. Passepartout was dispatched in search of the steward, and soon returned with two packs of cards, some pins, counters, and a shelf covered with cloth. The game commenced. Aouda understood whist sufficiently well, and even received some compliments on her playing from Mr. Fogg. As for the detective, he was simply an adept, and worthy of being matched against his present opponent. Now, thought Passepartout, we've got him. He won't budge. At eleven in the morning the train had reached the dividing ridge of the waters at Bridger Pass, seven thousand five hundred and twenty-four feet above the level of the sea, one of the highest points attained by the track in crossing the Rocky Mountains. After going about two hundred miles, the travelers at last found themselves on one of those vast plains which extend to the Atlantic, and which nature has made so propitious for laying the iron road. On the declivity of the Atlantic Basin the first streams, branches of the North Platte River, already appeared. The whole northern and eastern horizon was bounded by the immense semicircular curtain which is formed by the southern portion of the Rocky Mountains, the highest being Laramie Peak. Between this and the railway extended vast plains, plentifully irrigated. On the right rose the lower spurs of the mountainous mass which extends southward to the sources of the Arkansas River, one of the great tributaries of the Missouri. At half-past twelve the travelers caught sight for an instant of Fort Halleck, which commands that section, and in a few more hours the Rocky Mountains were crossed. There was reason to hope, then, that no accident would mark the journey through this difficult country. The snow had ceased falling, and the air became crisp and cold. Large birds, frightened by the locomotive, rose and flew off in the distance. No wild beast appeared on the plain. It was a desert in its vast nakedness. After a comfortable breakfast served in the car, Mr. Fogg and his partners had just resumed whist, when a violent whistling was heard, and the train stopped. Passepartout put his head out of the door, but saw nothing to cause the delay. No station was in view. Aouda and Fix feared that Mr. Fogg might take it into his head to get out, but that gentleman contented himself with saying to his servant, "'See what is the matter.' Passepartout rushed out of the car. Thirty or forty passengers had already descended, amongst them Colonel Stamp Proctor. The train had stopped before a red signal which blocked the way. The engineer and conductor were talking excitedly with a signalman, whom the station-master at Medicine Bow, the next stopping-place, had set on before. The passengers drew around and took part in the discussion, in which Colonel Proctor, with his insolent manner, was conspicuous. Passepartout, joining the group, heard the signalman say, "'No, you can't pass. The bridge at Medicine Bow is shaky and would not bear the weight of the train.' This was a suspension bridge thrown over some rapids about a mile from the place where they now were. 
According to the signalman, it was in a ruinous condition, several of the iron wires being broken, and it was impossible to risk the passage. He did not in any way exaggerate the condition of the bridge. It may be taken for granted that, rash as the Americans usually are, when they are prudent there is good reason for it. Passepartout, not daring to apprise his master of what he heard, listened with set teeth, immovable as a statue. Hm! cried Colonel Proctor. But we are not going to stay here, I imagine, and take root in the snow. Colonel, replied the conductor, we have telegraphed to Omaha for a train, but it is not likely that it will reach Medicine Bow in less than six hours. Six hours? cried Passepartout. Certainly, returned the conductor. Besides, it will take us as long as that to reach Medicine Bow on foot. But it is only a mile from here said one of the passengers. Yes, but it's on the other side of the river. And we can't cross that in a boat? asked the colonel. That's impossible. The creek is swelled by the rains. It is a rapid, and we shall have to make a circuit of ten miles to the north to find a ford. The colonel launched a volley of oaths, denouncing the railway company and the conductor, and Passepartout, who was furious, was not disinclined to make common cause with him. Here was an obstacle indeed which all his master's banknotes could not remove. There was a general disappointment among the passengers who, without reckoning the delay, saw themselves compelled to trudge fifteen miles over a plain covered with snow. They grumbled and protested, and would certainly have thus attracted Phileas Fogg's attention if he had not been completely absorbed in his game. Passepartout found that he could not avoid telling his master what had occurred, and with hanging head he was turning towards the car, when the engineer, a true Yankee named Forster, called out, "'Gentlemen, perhaps there is a way, after all, to get over.' "'On the bridge?' asked the passenger. "'On the bridge. With our train? With our train.' Passepartout stopped short and eagerly listened to the engineer. "'But the bridge is unsafe,' urged the conductor." "'No matter,' replied Forster. "'I think that by putting on the very highest speed "'we might have a chance of getting over.' "'The devil!' muttered Passepartout. "'But a number of the passengers were at once attracted "'by the engineer's proposal, "'and Colonel Proctor was especially delighted "'and found the plan a very feasible one. "'He told stories about engineers leaping their trains "'over rivers without bridges by putting on full steam.' and many of those present avowed themselves of the engineer's mind. "'We have fifty chances out of a hundred of getting over,' said one. Eighty, ninety. Passepartout was astonished, and though ready to attempt anything to get over Medicine Creek, thought the experiment proposed a little too American. "'Besides,' thought he, "'there's still a more simple way, and it does not even occur to any of these people.' "'Sir,' said he aloud to one of the passengers, the engineer's plan seems to me a little dangerous, but eighty chances, replied the passenger, turning his back on him. I know it, said Passepartout, turning to another passenger, but a simple idea. Ideas are no use, returned the American, shrugging his shoulders, as the engineer assures us that we can pass. Doubtless, urged Passepartout, we can pass, but perhaps it would be more prudent. What? Prudent? cried Colonel Proctor, whom this word seemed to excite prodigiously. At full speed, don't you see? At full speed? I know, I see, repeated Passepartout. But it would be, if not more prudent, since that word displeases you, at least more natural. Who? What? What's the matter with this fellow? cried several. The poor fellow did not know to whom to address himself. Are you afraid? asked Colonel Proctor. I afraid? Very well, I will show these people that a Frenchman can be as American as they. All aboard, cried the conductor. Yes, all aboard, repeated Passepartout, and immediately. But they can't prevent me from thinking that it would be more natural for us to cross the bridge on foot and let the train come after. But no one heard this sage reflection, nor would anyone have acknowledged its justice. The passengers resumed their places in the cars. Passepartout took his seat without telling what had passed. The whist players were quite absorbed in their game. The locomotive whistled vigorously. 
The engineer, reversing the steam, backed the train for nearly a mile, retiring like a jumper in order to take a longer leap. Then, with another whistle, he began to move forward. The train increased its speed, and soon its rapidity became frightful. A prolonged screech issued from the locomotive. The piston worked up and down twenty strokes to the second. They perceived that the whole train rushing on at the rate of a hundred miles an hour hardly bore upon the rails at all. And they passed over. It was like a flash. No one saw the bridge. The train leaped, so to speak, from one bank to the other, and the engineer could not stop it until it had gone five miles beyond the station. But scarcely had the train passed the river when the bridge, completely ruined, fell with a crash into the rapids of Medicine Bowl. End of chapter 28